Once again, my name is Ken, uh, and this is my presentation, which is the journey to give every single scientist in the whole world a supercomputer. So before I get started, how many people here have heard of PyCloud? Great, that's a pretty good proportion of you guys. So I would say then 60% of you here have a supercomputer at your fingertips, and by the end of this presentation, hopefully 100% of this room will realize you all have supercomputers. So as a quick roadmap, I'm going to talk a little about the vision for the project we have, that is PyCloud, um, show you where we are now, jump back and show you how we got here, and then talk a little about the future. And uh, then I'll conclude the presentation. So before we go any further, this is the vision for the project PyCloud. It's software computing power is utility. Now when I say utility, I very much mean utility, like how electricity is a utility. Right now you can go into a room, flip a light switch, plug in a lamp, and without even knowing it, you're actually leveraging a billion dollar electric grid, actually multi-billion dollar electric grid. You don't even realize it these days. Likewise, we want developers to be able to plug in a couple lines of code and instantly leverage tens of thousands of cores of computational power, just like as if they were simply plugging in a lamp to the wall. We'll realize and we'll know that we're successful when that is the case, when developers no longer have to think about computational power. They take their algorithm and push it off into the cloud, the supercomputing cloud. So ultimately what this means for you is you will have a supercomputer at your fingertips and you can check, and as I'll show you in terms of demos with PyCloud today, you'll kind of see that, you know, we're pretty far along and you can already see exactly how much computational power is gatherable in a kind of very, very easy way. So without going any further, let's go ahead and run a quick Hello World Pi, uh, program with PyCloud. So I'm going to define a very simple function called SQ, square. It'll take in a number, it'll square it, and it's also going to print hello world. So to do this, I'm going to go to the console really quick. So go ahead and start up IPython. Basic idea, we can define the square function. This, whoa, hard to see a little bit. hello world, and it's going to return x times x. Very, very simple example. Okay, how do we move square, which does this, over to the cloud? All we do is import the cloud library, which any of you guys can pip install at home or even right now, and to offload it to the cloud, all you need to do is pass it into our library with a value. Let's square the number, say, 9. Okay. It returns J, which is what we call a job ID. It's a unique ticket indicating what exactly which job uh, we just ran on the cloud. We can check the status of this job, see it's, hey, done, and then we can check the result. That's it. So it's a very, very simple example in terms of function, but realize that you can increase the complexity of this function very trivially, doing whatever scientific computation you're doing or just numerical analysis, data processing, and it'll be that easy to push it off to the cloud. Most of the time. Of course, there's some caveats, right? Uh, we can do something like cloud.info really quick, just to see how long it took. So the runtime of the job, we can see it, whether it had an exception or not. In this case, there's nothing. And we can also see the standard out, which is hello world. Very, very simple. OK, let's go ahead and map this function. So now we can go ahead and square, say, the first 20 numbers. Now we have an X range, so we have 20 different jobs now. We can check the status of all of them. You can see the processing. Some are queued, some are done. And I'm sure they'll all be done by now. Internet's a tad slow, so sometimes it'll take some time. But yeah, here we go. So without even knowing it, this computation could have run on up to really just 20 cores in parallel, because we had 20 separate jobs pushed to the cloud. Now we can actually tune it a little bit to actually make it so that a specific number of cores are used. Uh, before I show you how to do that, you know, we, we can actually do this. So by default, uh, your computation runs on a kind of 1 to 1.25 gigahertz Intel Xeon 2007 core. If you want to boost that up to, say, something much newer, oops, all you need to do is use the type keyword. So now we can run this on a 2.5 gigahertz machine. That easy. 
So I hope you're starting to get a feel for exactly what I'm showing you. Yes, it's easy to offload a function, but kind of the key part about the whole PyCloud framework is that we're entirely abstracting away the server. You're not seeing servers, you're not seeing cores, you're seeing none of the plumbing that goes with server management. You don't have to deploy any code. Everything is done completely seamlessly and automatically. In other words, and I hope there's no IT people in the crowd, but in other words, your IT people, your companies, and the places where you work won't have as much to do these days. Their jobs are going to get a whole lot easier, um, maybe a little too easy in some cases. And so here we go. The jobs have run on a 2.5 gigahertz machine, and now they're also done. including, say, the standard out, hello world. Nice and easy. Now, realize, too, that instead of running 20 jobs that took, say, one millisecond each, we could be running a thousand jobs or thousands of jobs or even a million jobs running on top of a thousand cores, 10,000 cores. And to see how you do that, you know, it's really easy. You just go to real-time cores right here. Whoops. On this interface, you can just click on real-time cores. You can see prior to this presentation, I reserved 80 cores. And I can actually just go and reserve another, say, 320. That's all it takes. There was no server management. You don't have to go to Amazon, Rackspace, call up your local dealer. It all just happens completely automatically with really just a few clicks of the button. So, assuming that the demo didn't work, or if the demo didn't work, this is what I would be showing you instead. Luckily, in this case, we didn't fall this. We're no longer looking from server to server to server, seeing exactly what went wrong. You can just go to this interface and see all your jobs consolidated into one easy-to-use, simple interface. And here's kind of the information we just saw in kind of a more complicated job. Okay, so I bet you guys are wondering now. This is really cool, but hey, that was a really simple function. Does it support custom pure Python modules, objects as arguments, NumPy, SciPy, Scikit, et cetera, anonymous functions. The answer to those is absolutely. Right out of the box, you can go ahead and start using these inside your function, offload those, pass them through a cloud module, whether it's a map or a call, and those will automatically work. Uh, there's certain other things like arbitrary C extensions, th things that actually need to be compiled. Uh, for that, it's not as magical. It's not as automatic. You can't simply do it through your Python console. But we have an easy to use interface called environments, which I might be showing you later, which will show you, um, which makes it really easy just to SSH into a server, install the files you need, libraries and binaries you need, and then you can simply save that file system, save that server, and then we automatically worry about distributing that code, a library and binaries, over to all the cores that you use that utilizes those dependencies. You can also do things like even calling non-Python pro programs from Python using that same method. You can create an environment, put random programs in there. It could be FFmpeg, could be anything, and you can call it from Python uh, on the cloud. Okay, so uh, this is ultimately then the, 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 uh, an image of kind of the goal we're trying to achieve. It's to make the world further and further flat, if you guys are familiar with Thomas Friedman's book. Uh, and so, you know, you can imagine now that you don't have to be a scientist, developer, engineer at a Google or any national laboratory to leverage this much computational power. Now you can be anyone in the whole world with an internet connection. It's pretty amazing to think that just 30 years ago, you know, Bill Gates was trying to put a desktop on top of, you know, every single, a desktop computer on top of, well, I guess every desktop in the whole country. Uh, these days, we're trying to give every single person in the whole world um, a supercomputer at their fingertips. Okay, so how did we get on this path? 
Um, and you know, that, that's, that's kind of a, a long story. Uh, but kind of my co-developer, Aaron, and I, uh, we graduated from college, 2008 from Berkeley. And you know, part of us always wonders you know, why we didn't go and try to make that next great social network. Or I guess these days, it'd be more of like a social sharing application. Maybe instead of uh, renting out your house, you'd be renting out your pets or maybe your grandparents, right? It could be something like that that we would have worked on and sold. Um, Instead, actually, Aaron and I spent quite a significant amount of time doing research at kind of our respective kind of laboratories while at Berkeley. Uh, in particular, I worked in a brain machine interfaces lab there, where we dealt with a lot of the kind of data processing issues that PyCloud now solves. Now, when I first tried to tackle the issues, it was much, much less mature. Uh, first, I wasn't using Python. It was a combination between Java and MATLAB, and it was called the Remote Data Processor. Uh, let's just say that given those two combinations, it was a very, very difficult project to work on. I would say it hardly worked, was very clunky, and to top it all off, the server where all my code was, I wasn't doing any revision control, was actually stolen. In what was probably the biggest freak kind of theft ever at Berkeley, because someone actually broke into the server room, and with 200 servers there, they chose two computers, one of which was the server where all my code was sitting on. So, you know, it just wasn't meant to be at that point in time. Instead, Aaron and I actually graduated and decided to work on something else called the auto tagger. Basic idea, it was a simple way to uh, automatically detect and recognize faces on Facebook. Why? Pretty much because at that point in time, 90 million photos were being uploaded every single day onto Facebook. I'm sure it's way more today. Uh, Two-thirds of them were being tagged according to our analysis, so 60 million clicks on faces every single day. What a bunch of wasted effort is what we thought. Uh, so really, it was a machine learning dream. Unfortunately, it was the first time we were using the cloud. The cloud was fairly new at, the po at that point in time, and so really it became a server management nightmare. We realized we were spending about 50% of our time on the facial, recognition, uh, facial detection and recognition algorithms, and really the other 50% of time on just plumbing, just how to get these servers to work. And it's at that point in time we realized that we're onto something much, much bigger. We could generalize the auto tagger backend system and essentially make it work for anyone, anyone in science. Specifically, scientists who aren't computer scientists, but still rely on all the computing power necessary these days to analyze the data that they have, whether they be in, say, chemistry, geophysics, physics, neuroscience, etc. So, um, Exactly how did we go from AutoTagger to PyCloud? Uh, you know, it actually wasn't very, it wasn't a very clear path because, you know, we had to think of, hey, how could we make uh, cloud computing even easier? And really the inspiration for it was the, was the ORM, the Object Relational Mapping System that we built rebuilt in PyCloud. Um, the next talk in this room is actually SQL Alchemy talk. SQL Alchemy is something you should use. We saw SQL Alchemy, we thought this is great, but then we decided, hey, let's just build it ourselves anyway. And so that's what we did. Now, ultimately, that's not a very smart thing to do in general. It's a lot of wasted effort. You should probably just contribute to SQL Alchemy. But it did teach us a significant amount of, uh, about Python, which we ended up using uh, for PyCloud. So, um, yeah, you know, we were kind of very, very into the performance of our ORM. Uh, Django's ORM at the time was poor. SQL Alchemy is, you know, very good. Uh, a little bit of the whole not invented here syndrome. And, you know, it was just for personal edification and fun. So things we learned, very simple. This is a novice talk. You know, things like keyword arguments. Uh, wasn't really familiar with these in Java, C Sharp, or any previous languages I used. Basic idea, you know, we can make cloud.call take arbitrary arguments. That will then map to the person's function. More so, we can also look through those keyword arguments and see special cased ones, things that have underscores, such as underscore type, labeling, things that are PyCloud specific, and we can strip those out, process them as we need, and then pass the rest of the arguments they made over to their actual function. Very, very cool, very, very convenient. Uh, things like pickling. So you can serialize any object, class, or function into a disk. We learned about it because we were trying to serialize into the database as a blob entry. You can also send it over the network. How about anonymous functions? Well, you know, we tried to pickle anonymous functions like lambdas. Didn't work. But hey, ends up if you poke around the attributes of a function enough, you realize actually a lot, pretty much the entire thing is there for you to play with. If you just dir a function, you can see the closure, the code, defaults, all the arguments necessary. It's kind of that easy in Python to just be introspective, to look around the whole stack, to look around the whole machine and the interpreter. Now, one of the kind of hacks we did is that the func code object actually can't be set. It's a read-only attribute. And so we actually had to use some C types hackery to eventually get that, work, that to work. So to be able to take bytecode from one anonymous function, serialize it, and then eventually create a new function out of it on a new machine. So there's a whole bunch of hacking we had to do, but ultimately it was a kind of very, very cool experience, which we, as you can see now, results in a very seamless experience 
when, when it comes to using PyCloud. Uh, lastly, or not lastly, but there's also module finders, AST module. So the module finder allows you to see all the imports inside a module. Why is that important? Because when you do a cloud.call and you pass in a function, we figure out all the dependencies, right? We're actually saying, hey, what functions or what modules does that function rely on? And we transfer those over to PyCloud as well automatically so that you don't have to do any deployment. And for that, we use you know, these two different modules. Last thing is that's really cool is the inspect module. Now, we don't actually use this inside the Python library, inside our Python client library. But the cool thing here uh, is that you can actually check to see your stack frame that you're currently in, and you can actually get all the stack frames below you. Not sure how many of you people have actually used it, but you know, if you ever forget to pass in a variable into a function, no sweat. You can just check the stack frames, go to the one below you, and rip it out. How many of you have actually done that? Good. It's horrible programming practice, but it's something that's really cool and very specific to Python. OK, so all this built up to essentially this project, PyCloud, offering cloud computing in a very simplified manner. OK, so we like to go back and almost benchmark ourselves to see how well we're doing. Um, and to do that, you know, how well kind of the, the, the how nicely the code base is built. Uh, and so to do that, we, rather how seamless we've made kind of our, 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 our library called Cloud. And so to do that, we'd like to go back and just run the auto tagger example we'd been building initially prior to PyCloud to see how easy it would have been for us to offload facial detection algorithms to the cloud. So to do that, let's have a quick example. It's not too graphical, but the basic idea is, so we have a version of the face detector that runs locally and a version that runs on the cloud. And we can quickly see that the difference between the two is very minimal. It's, it's simply two lines of code change. Instead of doing a map, we do a cloud.map. So we're mapping this function across a bunch of images in which these images, we, we actually want to detect the faces inside them. And then we simply call cloud.iResult to get the result of all these images. Now, each face, the face detection we do on an image can take, you know, quite a bit of time. So, you know, 10, 20 seconds because it's a fairly complex algorithm. That was the subject of Aaron's kind of master's thesis. So, um, you know, we could run it locally, but it would take some time. Instead, thanks to all the real-time cores I've allocated, we can simply run it uh, on the cloud. Here. OK, and it'll be taking some time. Um, out of the interest of time, it will return. I just kind of want to show you what's going to come out here. Basic idea, we're running our face detection al algorithms across all these photos. And when this is completed, OK, you can see it's starting to come back. So the first job is finished, but remember, we have a bunch running in parallel. So as they start finishing, they should start, fin start finishing quite quickly. Come on, internet. So how are the images being passed up to the server? Yeah, so we actually automatically serialize the images. There's two ways to do it. And you know, if you check our website, you can actually see that we have a way of specifically handling data. In this case, we take advantage of a very, very kind of seamless feature, which is that if you have an image object open, we'll automatically pickle that and shuffle it over as well. So very easy serialization. Um, OK, it's taking some time. I guess it's because of the internet connection. At the interest of time, we'll, we'll revisit this later. Oh, there we go. OK, a couple more. OK, well, because we kind of figured the internet might have, be having issues, I've gone ahead and brought about the annotated images. So these were the originals. You can see the detected faces here. And you can actually see annotated images uh, here. So you can kind of just nicely see. Hey, look, there we are. And the tree is also a face. Kind of shows you how the face detection algorithm works. OK. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and come back to this example in a little bit. I'm just going to kind of skip over for now. Um, if we have enough time, we'll do it. Algorithm publishing. It's algorithm pub 
publishing. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it, we make it very easy, simple in PyCloud to, we make it very easy for you to offload your computation. And a lot of times people think, hey, it's so easy, you know, it clearly isn't, you know, a very big deal. I mean, all you're doing is kind of moving my computation over to some server sitting on top of Amazon EC2. Well, it's important to see what you, what's really happening behind the scenes. So first, you know, you have this language integration, this very, very easily pickling method that makes it simple to offload functions to the cloud. You also have auto-scaling. So as you, you know, process more and more functions, our system is actually automatically scaling the number of cores that you get for your computation. You can both set it explicitly, like we did with real-time cores, but you can also have it done automatically by us in kind of a very cost-effective manner. Um, load distribution, so we're automatically shuffling these jobs over to servers, packing them nicely, packing them the most efficient way as possible. Uh, security, so you know, we're going ahead and just encrypted all the information you're sending to us, and we encrypt it when we send it back to you. You know, things that everyone should be doing, but when you just roll it on your own, you don't necessarily take these security precautions. High availability, so if a server were to fail, you wouldn't even notice. We would automatically start this computation on a new core. No problem. Uh, you don't have to deploy your code, there's no concept of versioning, because we're doing this versioning automatically for you. And also portability. Uh, at some point, we plan on being able to provide PyCloud over many different clouds. In terms of monitoring, so without doing anything, you got that easy to use interface, uh, easy to use web dashboard interface. Okay, so I'm gonna jump quickly into architecture because I think that's something you guys would like to see. You know, at the most high level, you have Python applications are communicating with the Python platform. Underneath, we're masking the servers that are running. So whether they be from Amazon Web Services, Rackspace Cloud, or even, you know, a private cluster or private data center. So here's your application, really simply. Pretty much you use the cloud library, which identifies and transmits dependencies. We say that it packages up a computational unit. That computational unit gets pushed off to us, to a collection of Django web servers that scales, given on how, many, kind of, how much workload is being given to us. Uh, then kind of all the information is passed off to uh, metadata storage, we have MySQL, MongoDB for your input arguments as well as your results, and a scheduling system to actually schedule your jobs for uh, the actual worker nodes that run them. So this is all stuff, you know, that we don't think Python programmers should have to work on. I mean, we're Python programmers, and really our goal is to keep you in the realm of Python. Monitoring interface. And uh, environment setup, like I was speaking about, is an easy way to customize your systems. Uh, customize for, you know, uh, Python extensions that require, you know, compilation. So pretty much for you, it's designed very much for ease of use. And from our side, you know, we're designing for scalability, high availability, and security. Okay. So, you know, just so to pique your interest, you know, today we talked a little about the compute side of PyCloud. We also have a big data initiative because at the end of the day, you know, Python is oftentimes only half the problem. Getting your data to the cloud to be computed is the other half. And lastly, customization, which I've kind of referred to multiple times. That's the environment feature. Go ahead and just check out our project website to kind of get a better feel for it. Okay, so kind of in conclusion, you know, this system has processed over 100 million jobs of, to date. Uh, for scientists from all over academia and industry, ranging from neuroscience, geophysics, whether it's, you know, in applications in oil and gas, to hedge funds, uh, physics, uh, computational chemistry, bioinformatics, genomic sequencing. Check out our blog, you can kind of see these type of uh, success stories that we have. And uh, basic idea is, you know, we're very proud to have such an easy to use platform, and we do see it changing how people think about using computational resources. These days, the friction and the level of the barrier to entry is just so low, uh, thanks to projects we believe like ours. And so that's it. Um, feel free to go to www.pycloud.com uh, and check it out. And yeah, we give 20 free core hours a month, which is plenty for a lot of people just to run things perpetually. And so, you know, you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, paying for anything. We just give plenty of compute units. And uh, we actually just recently gave out 80,000 core hours for free to eight academic researchers who applied to our ac academic research program. All right, thank you, guys. Um, um, there's time for one question, only one question. So I've used uh, EC2. Um, I like the way that you've subdivided the, uh, the machines into much smaller units for more atomic computation tasks. Um, 
With EC2, you have the limit of a one-hour computation job being the minimal limit. I'm curious why you didn't subdivide the one hour down to, say, the minute level so that I haven't got to worry about uh, whether my job runs for the full hour and utilizes uh, the cost that I'm paying for. So the question is, is that on EC2, you have to worry about bringing up servers, many servers, for one-hour time blocks because that's essentially when you're charged. Uh, so the great answer for you is on PyCloud, you know, because we're shuffling your computation from server to server to server, you actually just pay by the millisecond. So you're not paying by the hour, just don't worry about it. However long your computation takes, that's pretty much the amount you, that's essentially the amount you pay. Yeah, cool. Well, we run out of time, so thank you very much, and thank you for this, to Ken for speaking.